Well, good morning. It's good to see each of you here this Easter morning. Uh, we've been taking pictures of you. For those of you who only come to church on Easter, we wanted to get a picture before you, uh, so we'd know who you are when you came back next year. And uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty about it. I uh, just want to pick on you, that's all. Um, but we do hope, those of you who are first-time guests, uh, we hope that you can connect with what God is doing among this body and, uh, and that you would consider it worth your time uh, to be able to find a place to worship, whether it's here or somewhere, that will inspire you to pursue God and to know Him. Uh, also, if you're a guest, uh, you, you may not know what we're doing study-wise. Um, we're studying through the Gospels and looking at the teachings of Jesus. Right now, specifically, <clears throat> we're looking at the teachings of Jesus on his identity. Like, what did Jesus say about himself and who he said he was? Now, I'll just go ahead and let you know that I'm on about my fifth handkerchief this morning. I have uh, contracted the bubonic plague, otherwise known as spring allergy, otherwise known as the manifestation of satanic hell. All right, so um, if I get some snot down here on the front row, it's, it's anointed snot, brother. It's anointed. It's coming from the Word of God. Uh, so <clears throat> just help, you know, you can work with me here. So I'll be coughing all over you. And, uh, anyway, uh, we're studying about the teachings of his identity, and, and so we've been looking at the formal titles that Jesus claimed about himself, these titles that he said, you know, I am the way, I'm the truth, I'm the life, and uh, I'm the bread of life, I'm the vine. And so we've been studying all these different things to see what Jesus said about himself, what he thought of himself, what he portrayed about himself, and so we can try to wrap our heads around that. Uh, this morning, we're going to talk about probably the most applicable one that we could talk about on Easter, and that is Jesus' claim to be the resurrection. Jesus not only claimed to resurrect, to, to, he not only said that he was going to be resurrected, he actually claimed to be the literal resurrection, that, that he embodied all of that. In John chapter 11, verse 25, Jesus said to this woman, I am the resurrection and the life, and whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. So what we're going to do this morning is, is have a conversation that is not necessarily, uh, if those of you like to study the Bible, this is not an exegetical conversation. In other words, we're not going to take this verse and really kind of extrapolate it out and really dissect all the pieces and parts, but instead we're going to step back and look at this assertion that Jesus made that he is the resurrection. For him to be the resurrection, he must be resurrected. <laughs> if he did not rise from the grave, then this concept that he is the resurrection and therefore we can have a resurrected life in him is totally done away with. The entire Christian faith, the entire Christian faith hangs on the resurrection of Christ. If he died and went in a tomb and rotted in that tomb, then you should never read a Bible, you should never attend another church service, and you should have no faith that there is even a God. But if he is risen, then you have every reason to acknowledge that and live your life as a result of it. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to kind of very quickly walk through the three biggest reasons that you and I have to believe in the resurrection. From what is called a minimal facts argument. A minimal facts argument says, I will only defend my position with facts that everybody can agree on. Now, who's the everybody? Uh, the everybody is not those in the college dorm that think they know more than anybody. You know, the smartest I was was about my freshman and sophomore year in college. I was a genius then, you know? And unfortunately, the older I get, the more I find out I don't know, right? You all know, remember how smart you were? And some of you are in that phrase right now. You're going, I am that smart. Well, you're really not. Um, you just don't know it yet, you know? And so uh, when I was 20, 21 years old, I was an absolute rocket scientist, you know? And I just seem to be getting dumber the older I get. And I have people tell me when my son gets older, he will tell me exactly how dumb I really am. Um, I remember doing that to my parents. Uh, so anyway, <clears throat> what, what, I'm, what I'm proposing here this morning are three of the biggest reasons based on facts that liberal scholars, critical scholars, and even non-Christian scholars 
all agree that these are facts. As a matter of fact, what I'm going to bring to you today, the information, the facts that I'm going to use to defend the reasons on why you and I can believe that the resurrection of Christ did indeed happen, the facts that I'm going to give you today are almost considered universally accepted among scholars. Now, if you get on the internet and you get on blogs, you will find these uh, the, the modern contemporary atheists, they, they don't care about scholarship. They like to say that they're smarter than you are because you're stupid and believe in Jesus. Therefore, you're dumb and we're not. If you'll be like us, then you won't be stupid. Most of the arguments of the contemporary atheist movement are not based on scholarship, archaeology. They're based on adjectives. You're dumber than I am. If you read their writings, they're extremely sarcastic. I, I've read parts. I own the book God Delusion, read parts of that by Richard Dawkins. There's no one any more sarcastic and more attacking and, and less interested in, in objective arguments than Richard your Dawkins, and yet he's praised as supposed to be this smart guy. So if you connect with that, then you will probably take issue with, with what I'm saying. However, if you're sitting here today and you actually follow scholarship, you actually follow the arguments that are given for and against, you actually focus in on the evidences that are out there, you will know that what I'm saying is true. Now, uh, before I get into this, I want to give you two names. There's a guy named Gary Habermas. Uh, he is considered to be one of the world's experts on the resurrection. Not the, one of the world's Christian experts, but one of the experts on the resurrection. His name is Dr. Gary Habermas. He has a PhD from Michigan State. So he didn't exactly get his degree from Bob Jones, fundamentalist, King James only. I will stuff my Bible in your mouth, all right? He got it from one of the, a sec, I, I doubt Michigan State is really interested in convincing people that the resurrection of Christ really happened, okay? So he got his PhD from there, and, uh, and, he's, and he serves, he's a friend of mine. I know him. He's a professor at Liberty. Uh, there's another guy named Dr. Uh, William Lane Craig. Uh, he is, again, considered one of, one of the premier Christian apologists in our country and around the world. Um, uh, he, again, is a guy who's been trained at the University of Munich, uh, the University of Birmingham in England. This guy is considered one of the most brilliant minds in Christian realm. Both of these guys present the arguments that I'm giving you today. You can get on the internet. You can listen to their deals. Uh, these are guys who are not invited to speak um, at, you know, the second Presbyterian Baptist Methodist Church down here of the, of the Holy Spirit incarnate, uh, well, bless God, they're going to shout, yell, scream, tell you what do, what not do, when you're going to do it, and how to do it, and we don't care about logic or reason. Uh, these guys are invited to speak at Harvard, Princeton, Yale. These are normal guests at Cal Berkeley, Cal Poly. You can get on the, inter on the, on the web, on the interstate. <laughs> you can get on the interstate and drive to Lynchburg here, too. Um, but uh, these guys are invited to the, to the pinnacle of intellectual conversations to have conversations from a Christian standpoint. Uh, recently, Dr. Gary Habermas spoke at UNC Chapel Hill and gave a lecture there at the invitation of the people at UNC Chapel Hill. So this is the kind of guy I'm talking about. Y'all follow me so far? The information I'm giving you is produced, the stuff I'm giving you today, you can find from these two guys as well as a lot of others. So I just want to qualify to those of you here today that are skeptics that I'm not just pulling this stuff out of the eye, out of the, uh, off the internet somewhere. Uh, I remember somebody said, listen, I read it on the internet. It's got to be true. Um, I'll pick that up later, right? So <clears throat> this information is being driven and steered by some of the greatest minds of our time and are respected by people who are not even Christian. So with that said, what are the three greatest arguments out there? Uh, the first one on the three greatest arguments of why you and I can believe that today is a celebration of the risen Savior and not a dead Jesus, all right? The first reason is this. The scholarship of the written records claiming the resurrection of Christ is well within secular standards. So in other words, <clears throat> um, critics will look at the Bible and the writers of the Bible and want to know, okay, how close were they associated to when the events occurred when they wrote them? Um, they want to know by what authority they're writing them. In other words, uh, if I said, uh, tomorrow you got up and opened the Gas the Gazette and you read an article by me on how to build a spaceship, then you would know that that was a total comic strip, all right? Because I don't know jack diddly about building a spaceship. The only thing I know about building a spaceship is that you would need to call NASA. That would be the end of my article, all right? I have no authority to write on it. So critics want to know, okay, if this guy wrote on the subject, by what authority is he writing? Is he the kind of guy that we can trust that he knows what he's talking about when he wrote it? Does he have proper witness accounts? Does he have blah, 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 blah? So when scholars judge the Bible, how does it stand out? Uh, I did a whole sermon last fall on this, so I'm just going to give you a couple quick little points, um, but I'll just say this. 
There is a, uh, let me read this to point to you. It is universally accepted that the most reliable biography of Alexander the Great was written 400 years after he lived. By contrast, it is universally accepted that all four Gospels in the Bible were written within 65 years of the resurrection. Mark was written 40 years after, Matthew was written, 50, was written 50 years after, Luke 55, and John 65. All four Gospels claim that Jesus Christ was risen. All four of them. You can go on to the next slide. So, we understand, when, when you're looking at ancient texts, the most reliable ancient text, Anthony Flew was a famous atheist in the 20th century. He's since died, but he's one of the most famous atheists. <clears throat> he was a liberal scholar, and he said the most reliable ancient text that we have is the Bible. In other words, well, the guys that wrote what they're writing about are writing it from the standpoint that they say they're writing about. We can trust that what's in there was what was written by the guys who wrote it. Even secular scholars agree on that. Uh, but their favorite thing, uh, when they're measuring tools, is they love the Apostle Paul. They love what the Apostle Paul wrote. Liberals are, man, they just get all giddy about the books in the Bible that the Apostle Paul wrote as historical documents. Liberal scholars are more willing to accept Paul's writing than they are even the Gospels. They'll pick the Gospels apart, even though they believe them, uh, that they were written when they were written. They still say parts of them are not supposed to be there, blah, 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 blah. But anyway... Among Paul's writings, one of the most universally accepted letters written by Paul is the letter of 1 Corinthians. He wrote this letter to the believers in a, in a city called Corinth. Everybody in the world of scholarship believes Paul wrote it, and that he wrote it to the Corinthians, and that what we have is what he actually wrote. What did Paul write? Well, in 1 Corinthians 15, listen to what he wrote. Now, I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you which you received, in which you stand, <clears throat> and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins. Now, when he says <clears throat> he received it, <clears throat> he's referring to this. For those who don't know anything about Paul, Paul had a job. Uh, Paul was one of the biggest religious leaders in Jerusalem. He was considered to be one of the most intelligent. He was considered a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Pharisee among the Pharisees, a Jew among the Jews. He was, Paul was like a rock star among the religious leaders. Y'all follow me so far? Uh, Paul was considered to be the, one of the smartest, most intellectual. Uh, to become a Pharisee, many had, you had to memorize much of the Old Testament. Paul is believed to have memorized all of the law and the prophets. I mean, this guy is a rocket scientist. His job in the early church was to arrest and kill Christians. <laughs> he later comes to Christ about two years after the resurrection of Jesus. They start mobilizing people to kill Christians, by the way, very soon after the resurrection. These Jesus, these Jesus followers were professing that he was risen and that he was God, and it was causing a tremendous problem in Jerusalem. And so they were killing these Christians. Paul stood there and held the jackets as they stoned one of the most famous ones named Stephen. And so he's on his way to Damascus to organize the arrest and killing of more Christians. And he meets Jesus. It's an incredible story. You ought to read it in Acts. He meets Jesus. He spends the next two to three years trying to figure out, all right, uh, he meets a few months after Christ, blah, 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 I'm getting my time out on this. But anyway, he spends about two or three years after the resurrection just studying on his own, trying to figure out who this Jesus guy is that he met and studying the Old Testament. He eventually comes back to Jerusalem, and, and he spends about two to three years there. So the average amount of time that scholars believe that happens from the resurrection of Christ until he ends up in the church of Jerusalem is about five years. He shows up in the church of Jerusalem, and a couple guys, one named Peter, you've probably heard of him, James is the brother of Jesus, John, the most beloved disciple, these guys are in charge, <clears throat> and they share with him the creed of the Christian faith. A creed is a doctrinal statement of this is what we believe. Scholars believe, what I'm about to read you in verse 3, scholars believe, liberal, critical, conservative, no matter what, they believe that this creed was formulated within a few months of the resurrection of Christ. In other words, Paul is meeting with people who knew Jesus personally, who claimed to witness the resurrection of Jesus, 
and who have formulated a doctrine of belief that Jesus is risen. Listen to what he writes. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the 12. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. Now listen to this. He appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, of whom most are still alive. In other words, and he says those are some fall asleep, not like, not like some of you want to do in my sermon right now, but like fell asleep as in dead. All right, that's what he means by it, okay? So he says, I, in other words, I know who these 500 people are because I know some of them are dead. Paul has gone out and researched this. Who are these people? What's their story? And he's saying 25 years later when he's writing this letter to the Corinthians that some of them have gone on and died. So he has interacted on about the deepest critical level that you can interact with on this claim that Jesus is risen. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, to an untimely board, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. In other words, what we can say is this. When you look at the biblical text, scholars alike say the Bible is the most reliable ancient text we have. Inside of this text, we have very clear claims that originate within months of Jesus that are recorded within a very short period of time. Alexander the Great's writings of him were 400 years post Alexander the Great, universally accepted as true. The writings about the resurrection of Christ, one of the earliest is 1 Corinthians. It's written only 25 years later. He received it two to three years later, all right, from when it happened. So what we're talking about is on a critical examination of the Bible. We have every reason to believe that what these guys wrote is what we have in our hand, and in what they wrote, they absolutely believed that Jesus had been risen. They were convinced of it. So, the first reason we have to believe in the resurrection is that the people who knew Jesus believed he was resurrected. Second reason, the amount and type of people who claimed to witness the resurrected Christ and were willing to die for that confession points to the sincerity of their belief. <clears throat> if, um, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> if a person tells me that they really believe something, what they do is what really demonstrates it. In other words, if you tell me, um, Austin, man, I really believe what this church is doing, but you know, we never see you in worship and you're not involved, then I would think you really don't believe in what we're doing. When you believe in something, you're part of it. If you say to your wife, you know, I believe in you, I believe in our marriage, then you will pursue for that marriage to be right. If you, if you say you believe in it, but you're not doing anything to make it better, then she has no reason to believe that you believe in it, right? Believe, to believe, to believe, <laughs> believe, believe, get my words. So uh, it's important then, if the guys who were preaching that Jesus was risen really believed it, then they would probably be willing to die for something like that. Peter. Peter denied Christ three times. He was done with Jesus. Jesus gets arrested. They say, hey, you're one of those Jesus followers, not me. I ain't with him. No, yes, you are. I'm not. Yes, you are. And then he curses him and says, I'm not. I had nothing to do with him. And there he said, after the death of Jesus, off by himself, off with the other disciples in a back room somewhere, crying and mourning as if he was gone. He believed it was over. They were in depression mode. Two women go out, find out the tomb's empty. They come back, you ain't going to believe this. Peter runs down there, he runs in the tomb, sees for himself, and spends the rest of his life proclaiming that Jesus Christ is risen and died, testifying of that. James, the brother of Jesus. How would you like to be the brother of Jesus? You know, I have a younger sister. <clears throat> I did pretty good in school, and, and uh, I, did, I did actually, did, I, did, I did fairly well in school. Um, did pretty good in sports. Um, was a goody goody kid, you know, I, I, I didn't really get in trouble. Uh, my sister came along behind me. She's seven years younger than me. My sister came along behind me. She has a learning disability. She has dyslexia. Uh, she had to go to Sylvan Learning Centers. I mean, she worked her tail off, ended up graduating, uh, I think, with a 3.2 or 3.3 GPA or something like that. You know, did a wonderful job through school, worked her rear end off. She's a great athlete. She did awesome in sports. Long comes my brother. 
Now, anytime he messed up, he had to hear where your sister had a learning disability and she was able to do it. You know, your brother, look what your brother did. Your brother went and led this school. Da, 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 da. Now, what are you going to do? He had to hear all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Can you imagine being the brother of Jesus? Your brother walked on water. What you got? Remember Lazarus? He raised him from the dead. Hey, what you going to do, big boy? You going to cook me dinner? Well, Jesus fed 5,000 with a couple little fishies and a couple little loaves of bread. What you got? I mean, can you imagine growing up with Jesus as your brother? He was sinless. How do you live up to that one? You know, you disobey your parents. Your brother never disobeyed because he's God. Shut up. You know, and... Uh, so it's important that you and I understand the significance of the story of James. James had no faith in Jesus at all. None. He was a total skeptic. He hated the very idea of Jesus until the resurrection. Well, Jesus rose from the grave. And James faced him. He realized this isn't my brother. He understood who he was and the significance of it. And James surrendered his life to the one that he had hated his whole life. And died testifying that he was alive. Jealous brothers don't die testifying that their brother came out of a grave and is God. But he did. Plus Paul. I already told you he was a murderer of Christians. He was the defender of the religious faith. He was the cultural leader of his time. He was the rising rock star of Judaism. Paul orchestrated the killing of Christians until he claimed to have been confronted by the risen Christ. Paul lived the rest of his life in utter, utter poverty, was beaten, was run out of every town he ever lived in, and was eventually killed because of his testimony that Jesus is alive. It was not a defense of religious tradition that Peter and James and Paul were martyred. It was not a defense of religious culture. It was not an insistent to be Baptist or Methodist or by God, we ain't never going to have no drums. It was an insistence that Jesus is alive. These men gave their life for that. If you need a reason to believe that Jesus Christ is alive, well, the first one is the Bible records it, and it's a very reliable piece of literature, considered to be the most reliable piece of ancient literature that we have in our hands. If you need a better reason than that, well, what about the hundreds and hundreds of people who met Jesus, claimed to have met Jesus, and were willing to die for that testimony? If that still doesn't satisfy you, then there's a third one. The third reason is what I consider to be the best. It's the empty tomb. The empty tomb is not a mere Sunday school lesson. The empty tomb is not something just to make a song about. It's not a phrase. It's not just something where somebody can raise their red handkerchief and wave it around and shout. The empty tomb is the greatest presentation of the resurrection of Christ we have. You say, well, no, it's not. Man, there's all kinds of theories out there. Well, every attempt at explaining the empty tomb apart from the resurrection of Christ has been debunked by scholars from every perspective. I'm going to try to share this with you as quickly as I can before my voice finally goes kaput. <clears throat> Here's some of the theories that if you watch, uh, like me, I'm a, I'm a cable TV geek, so I like A&E and History Channel and all this kind of stuff. If you like watching those channels, you will see these theories put out on the channels. Now, ironically, these theories are growing in their popularity among non-scholars, but they're totally disrespected by scholars. So like, you know, if you go in the average college dorm room, they'll be like, yeah, I just believe Jesus' body was stolen. That's what happened. But if you actually meet people who spend their life studying archaeology, studying the Bible, studying history, Critics, scholars, a whole ball of wax, conservative people who do believe in Jesus, liberal people who doubt Jesus, and then just flat out critics who don't believe it at all, all of them have debunked the theories I'm about to share with you, yet they're still popular uh, in college dormitories and coffee shops and, 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 uh, and water jugs and everything else at work. So what are they? Well, one of the first theories that people try to say to explain the, um, 
the empty tomb is this, that the body was simply stolen. Now, <clears throat> that has been debunked universally. Why? Well, as the first reason I'd share with you is because everybody believes that the writers of the New Testament believed he was resurrected. The only people that would have stole the body were the disciples. But they were willing to go to their grave saying he was risen. It is totally illogical that they would steal the body and then manufacture religion that would be willing to die for knowing they stole the body and the whole thing's defunct. About the time that a person raised the axe, they would go, okay, all right, all right, all right. I stole the body. Uh, you got me. I'm done. The other part is it's historically accurate. We know for a fact that the Jewish leaders were expecting the body to be stolen, and so they surrounded the tomb with Roman soldiers to keep it from happening. The testimony of his resurrection was within days of his crucifixion. There was still ample time to address this. The Jewish leaders never sought to actually demonstrate the body had been stolen because they couldn't, because it wasn't. The steps they took kept them from ever saying the body was stolen. So, from history that shows what was done to keep that from happening, to the testimony of the early church and a willingness to die, adds up that it's just not logical that one of the disciples stole Jesus' body. Second theory, and by the way, minimal facts, their liberal scholarship, critical scholarship, all agree that that's an absurd assertion. Second, some will then say, well, you know, I know why the tomb was empty. That's not a good reason for you to believe in the resurrection. The tomb was empty. Uh, th that is just simply something that was manufactured by disciples for personal gain. Well, okay, what personal gain did the disciples get for manufacturing the idea that Jesus was risen? Oh, well, they got their heads cut off. Their families died. They lived in total poverty. They lived among people who were starving to death because they were outcasts from society. So I could see how that really got them a lot of personal gain with that story. Scholars agree that that's ridiculous. But here's the real kicker. To those who like to sit in their college dorms and sit in their places and sit down at the, you know, at the lunch table at work and talk about, you know, all this is just made up. I saw it on A&E the other night. They just made all this stuff up so they could develop a religion to manipulate culture. Well, what's interesting is the claim of the resurrection happened within days of them putting a physical body in the tomb. The religious leaders of Judaism wanted Jesus gone. They got Paul to kill everybody who professed that he was risen. If they had simply made it up, what would be the easiest, most simplest way to show everybody they had made it up? Just walk everybody over to the tomb. Roll the stone back and go, y'all smell that? That is Jesus rotting. Would you like one of the maggots eating the flesh? Come on down here. I will show you his body. Getting rid of something being made up was easy. All they had to do was show him the body. But where were the Jews, Jewish, Jewish leaders to do that? They were absent. Why? Because they knew there was nobody in there. It was gone. The tomb was empty. If the tomb wasn't empty, the Jewish leaders had every reason to show that it wasn't empty. They were doing everything they could to suppress Christianity. And it was simple if there was a body in the grave. Third reason people give for the empty tomb. They say, well, okay. You know, the Bible, the problem is, you people don't even really understand the Bible. The Bible doesn't teach that Jesus was resurrected from the grave. The Bible just teaches that it was a spiritual resurrection. Well, that's idiotic. That is like either saying, A, you can't read, or B, you choose not to read what you do read. It takes a really intelligent person to make the Bible sound like it doesn't say that there was a bodily resurrection. Matter of fact, the Bible asserts it was heresy to say Jesus wasn't resurrected in bodily form. The first creed of the faith that I just read you claimed it. Uh, when you read the Gospels, they went out of their way to talk about that they had gave Jesus food to eat. If it's just a spirit, what's he going to eat? You know what I'm saying? So the Bible goes absolutely out of the way to say that it was a bodily resurrection. So this idea of a spiritual resurrection is absolutely absurd. Scholars all say that's obnoxious. You're an idiot if you believe that. That's a nice way of putting it. All right. 
So then people say, I got it. You Christians are all fooled. What happened, what ha happened was everybody was smoking some serious stuff and they hallucinated. Now, if you watch a &E, Biography Channel, History Channel, whatever, you'll see this argument. It was a mass hallucination. Mass. Over 500 people, all at the same time, had a hallucination. I listened to an argument on how that could theoretically happen on an A&E show one day. It was, it was hilarious. They finally got to the end of this show, all right, and said, oh, by the way, um, that can't happen, you know? And so they spent an hour telling us that it could happen and then got to the end of it and said it can't happen. You know why I had to say that? Because no one in their right mind would suggest that all of you in here could have a hallucination right now at the same time and that that hallucination would be the exact same hallucination that we all had. And if we did, then we'd all have to say we're smoking on the same pipe at the same time watching the same deal and we all had the same hallucination. That's crazy, all right? Furthermore, if it was an hallucination, what had to be done? Jewish leaders would simply do this. See the tomb? See the maggots? See the body? He ain't there. He's there. He's not. He's here in the grave. It was easily to debunk. One of the easiest things they could ever do was debunk 500 people who had a hallucination days after the crucifixion of Christ. They just go to the grave and show them the body and tell them all to stop smoking the weed. It had been easy. But they didn't. Why? Because there was no body in the tomb. It was empty. If there was a body in there, the Jewish leaders had every reason to point it out. Finally, this one. This is the most almost comical theory that's out there. There is a popular theory that Jesus actually didn't die. Now, the most comical theory is there, uh, uh, I read about this the other day, there's actually a man who's a professor in England who is asserting that there, uh, actually there was no such thing as Jesus, that he never lived. You know, apparently you can make a lot of money to say dumb stuff. Um, but, <clears throat> Short from asserting that Jesus never lived is this assertion on explaining the empty tomb. The reason the tomb was empty is because Jesus actually got up and walked out of the tomb. Now, y'all know how dumb that is. History has already said Jesus was absolutely a person. So this guy in England's off his rocker. That he was absolutely crucified. Now, people who are not even believers in Jesus atheists all agree that there was a man named Jesus and he was killed by the Jews and he was killed by crucifixion. Now, let me help you understand a little bit about crucifixion. Crucifixion is, is, a, is a means of torturing somebody to death. The Romans designed crucifixion to be a way to keep a person in pain and agony as long as possible, to keep them alive as long as possible, but to eventually die so that they could put on display their greatness and how big and bad Romans are. And if you mess with us, you will end up just like this guy. And so they would strip a person naked. They would nail them onto a cross, onto a tree, okay? They would nail them onto this tree. And, and a person would sit there. It would hang there by their arms and their legs. And so their legs finally could no longer hold them up. And their bodies would drop which would cause the chest to completely expand, meaning you could not contract, meaning you can't breathe, and you suffocate to death. Now, in Jesus' case, it is also documented that Jesus was physically brutalized before he was ever put on the cross. History records that Jesus was whipped with a particular type of beating that was normal. There was a counting of lashes and how many lashes and da 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 And these lashes were known for some to, to even kill some. Some wouldn't even survive this beating. Jesus survived it. It would rip the flesh off of your skin. It would expose bones and organs. It was a whip that had pieces of material in it. It would literally pull the flesh right out of your body. So imagine that Jesus has been through this brutal beating. He has been three days without food or water. He was nailed to a cross. And to make matters even more interesting, a Roman soldier took his spear and stuck it into the side of Jesus, and history records that water poured out. Now, what did he hit, his bladder? No. 
Medical science teaches us that when a person has, suffers a heart attack and they have cardiac arrest, the chest cavity actually fills with water. The heart, the actual sac around the heart fills with water. When the spear penetrated into that sac, into his heart, it caused that sac in the part of his heart to actually explode out all of this swelling in the water that had accumulated in his heart sac as he died. Jesus died of a heart attack, if you wanted to be, you know, scientific about it. So this Roman soldier pierces his side, water comes spewing out, testifying it has gone into the heart sac. He's dead. Now, if you're going to tell me that a man who's been through all that was put in a tomb, a stone that took multiple men to roll in front of it, was rolled over it. He suddenly wakes up, because we all, I mean, we all watch TV. I've seen 24 and Alias and all them shows. Y'all remember Alias? Man, you could die all the time in them. Y'all remember them? I remember my mama watched them soap operas. Somebody always died, and three months later, they come back to life. <laughs> they were, you know? You know, we see it happen all the time. You know, you, they give you this medicine, and it puts you to sleep, and it tricks everybody into thinking you're dead. Y'all seen that, right? I don't even know if it's real. It might be real, but I've seen it on TV. It has to be. And so that's what they did to Jesus. They put this, this stuff on that sponge, and they gave him that water, and it was an herb, and it was a secret herb, and it made him act like he was really dead, but he really wasn't dead. He was in a coma, and then he woke up from that coma, and then he rolled by himself with flesh hanging off of him, being beat to hell in a handbasket, hanging from a cross. He gets up after all of that, rolls a stone it took three men to put over it, and then walks out past a Roman, all these Roman soldiers sitting out there guarding the tomb, doesn't wake anybody up in the process. If that's your explanation of the resurrection, you got more faith than I got. Your God's actually better than my God. Because right, my Jesus was a God man. He was human, and he died on the cross because of all that. You're saying that he could survive all that and get up and walk out. You got a bigger God than I got. And so scholars go, that is the dumbest thing in the world to suggest, that A, Jesus didn't die, and that B, if he didn't die, that he would have the strength to just get up and walk out after three days, and that that somehow wouldn't have been seen, heard, or known of. So, in conclusion, I'm going to read you two people's quotes, and we're done. <laughs> William Lane Craig, again, one of the most respected intellectuals in, in the Christian faith, said, Modern scholarship offers no plausible explanation that the resurrection didn't happen. Second, this is what's really interesting. William Lane Craig's a Christian, and he says there's no plausible explanation the resurrection didn't happen. But what about somebody that's not a Christian? This guy named Pincus Lapide. Honest to God, that's his name. If my mom would have named me that, we'd have had a problem. I'd have changed my name to something, but it wouldn't have been no Pincus Lapide, all right? Pincus Lapide was a prominent Orthodox Jewish theologian and scholar. Orthodox Jew, not Christian. He rejected the New Testament teaching of the deity of Christ. He did not believe that Jesus was God. But he concluded that the Christian church, the church, was born out of an act of the will of God, which all the New Testament authors call the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Lapid believed the evidence was overwhelming and pointing to the certainty of the resurrection. Lapid so believed that the evidence pointed to the certainty of the resurrection that Pincus Lapid, an Orthodox Jewish theologian and scholar, basically offered a new version of Judaism. He refused to believe that Jesus was God, but he could not deny the resurrection. He studied it and was so convinced of the evidences of the resurrection that he offered back to Judaism. He wrote a book. He offered back to Judaism and says, listen, we have to fit this into our theology that God raised Jesus from the dead, and he essentially asserted that God was grafting in Gentiles into their faith through a different means, and they're all under the same umbrella, and da-da-da-da-da. He ticked off a lot of Judaism with it. But nonetheless, this is one of the most brilliant minds in Judaism went... Jesus really did rise from the grave. Modern scholarship has given up its assault on saying the resurrection didn't happen. It has found it, found it totally impossible to assert. I'm giving you all this information this morning for a reason. 
when it comes down to our life, I mean our life, are you worshiping a risen God? Or have you just signed up for the latest Southern religious tradition? It's just part of our culture. You know, we're Christian. It's just who we are. We do right. We don't do wrong. We go to church at least Easter and Christmas. (laughs) That's what I'm with. You might even be a really good Southern Christian, and you come to church every week. And I do right. You, You worship tradition and culture and religious ideas. Is that what you're engaged with? Are you engaged with the risen God who said, I am the resurrection and the life, and though you die, you will live? Which one are you serving this morning? That's my challenge to you. Which God do you serve? In just a moment, we're going to partake in one of the only two traditions in the Bible. The Bible tells us the first tradition is baptism, that when we give our life to Jesus Christ, he calls us to this obedient traditional act of baptism. I'm one of those guys, I don't care if you dunk, spat, spat on, knocked out, whatever, you know, it don't matter to me. What matters to me is that it is a testimony that you gave your life to Jesus. I do believe it means to be submersed, but I'm not hung up on that. But the tradition is it. This act of baptism testifies, I've given my life to Jesus. The other tradition that the Bible sets out for us is called communion. Jesus began this tradition the night that he was arrested. He sat down at a table with his disciples, and he told them to take of this bread and of this cup, and when they did it together, every time they did this together, to do it remembering him and the significance of him. So the question we have to ask ourselves this morning is, as we take this time of communion together, the question we have to ask ourselves this morning is, who are you remembering? Are you remembering a risen Savior, God, or a historical figure? Are you remembering someone who you have surrendered your life to? Or are you remembering someone that Grandma used to tell you about when you were a kid? Are you remembering the person who has changed you and who is steering you and leading you? Or are you remembering the person that you're scared of because one day you're going to stand in front of him and you know you are and I'm scared of him, so I better do right and go to church every now and then? Or are you remembering a living Savior that wants to live in you? Spirituality is not a measure of how religious you are. Spirituality is a measure of God in you, something that is real and alive, that's active. And so our band is going to come out. And they're going to lead us in a time of worship. Our deacons are going to come by and row by row. They're going to dismiss you one at a time, and one row at a time, and let you come down here and take of this age-old tradition called communion. I'll get you a bottle if you get my notes. Thanks, appreciate it. And you may come down and you may choose to grab a cup or a uh, piece of the bread and take it back to your seat. Or you may choose to grab it and and kneel down here and pray. You may choose to gather your family together and come as a family. You may choose to take it back to your seat, whatever. Our deacons are going to dismiss dismiss you row by row so we can keep some kind of order. Some of you will want to pray before you take it. Some of you will want to pray after. Some of you realize there's nothing about your life that gives testimony of a risen Christ. There's no real faith in your life. You went to church as a kid, and you gave your life to Jesus, but you got tired of hearing whining, fighting arguments about walls and carpets and Deacon Tater Head and Sister Fluffy Head and purple hair, and you got tired of being yelled and screamed at that you were going to hell and you were the worst person known to man, and you've just never been back to church since. But I'm here to encourage you that although human beings will fail you, our risen Christ will not. He defeated the grave God is doing something very special in this body, but we're still human too. Do you know what? We'll fail you too. So as you come forward today and you take of this, 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 oh, someone said wine. We don't want to get you drunk, so we use juice. And 
because some of you may drink the whole thing. You know, it'd just be bad if you were down here, just, you know, and just kind of kill communion. So anyway, so we got, anyway, the, you, you follow me? <laughs> when you come down here and you take this, take it and think about what you're doing. That you were saying, throughout the 2,000 years since God did this, set this up, that Jesus is alive. It's significant. But make sure you contemplate the meaning of that for yourself before you do it. And so whether it's kneeling and praying, whether it's doing it as a family, individual, maybe you want to come talk to me. You may be here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ. We would love the opportunity to pray with you and walk you through what it means to say, Lord God, here's my life. And to know that if today was your last breath, heaven was your destiny. If you've given up on God and walked away and somebody drug you here today and you're just waiting for me to shut up, maybe this would be the moment that you go, okay, God, you're alive indeed. You're real. And there's nothing about my life that really testifies that you're real. God, would you do that work in me that would make me believe? Do that work in me that gives everybody around me a reason to believe. I want to know you. I want to be filled by you. I want to be changed by you. I want you to heal me. The invitation of the gospel is to give our life to him and to absolutely run away with him on a journey that is mind-boggling, on a journey that is incredible, on a journey that when we get to the end of our life, we have exhausted ourselves for every good reason in eternity. And we step foot into eternity looking back with no regrets the gospel gives us that ability because Jesus is alive. So I'm going to pray and then the deacons are going to begin coming by row by row and dismissing you. When they come by, and uh, we'll all be standing and singing. When they come by to dismiss you, you can come down, take this, go back to your seat, take it, then go back, whatever. But we're just going to worship together and celebrate that we have every reason that our Jesus is alive. God, in this moment, as people come forward, there may be those who need to give their life to you. And before they take of this tradition, they need to just stop and say, God, I can't remember you yet because I've never given you my life. So here's my life. Now I'm ready to partake of this tradition. God, there may be those who are here who've just given up on you. And it's almost entirely the fault of the hypocrisy and idiocracy in the American church. God, may you do such a work in this body May you do such a work in here every week as we gather and every day as we work together that we can restore people's faith in you by being the living Jesus to them. God, for those who are here today and they've hit the bottom, they have run from you and they've found the bottom. May they know that the ladder of your grace goes all the way down there and you're standing right beside them and your blood has forgiven them, and you simply long to haul them out of that hole. God, for those who've come here today and their marriages are done, may they first find their hope in a risen Savior and then watch what you can do in their marriage. You are risen, therefore all things are possible. Give us the freedom to express that to you in this time as we cry out and sing our praises. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Why don't you stand? Our deacons will come by in just a moment.